Welcome to the first cut lecture. Cuts or cutting planes are extremely important in integer programming, uh, where they're usually used to obtain higher quality LP relaxations and uh, therefore getting better bounds. Unlike in the song, in our case, the deeper is the cut, the better, uh, because a deeper cut means a better quality relaxation, and this is exactly what we want to achieve. So we'll start this topic by discussing the Gomery cuts, uh, which is a classical approach uh, dating back to 1950s. Gomery cuts were introduced by Ralph Gomery in his 1958 paper, and this was a major theoretical breakthrough at that time. And uh, for the next couple of decades, uh, these methods were largely considered to be of theoretical value. But this gradually changed, and uh, by the end of 90s, it wouldn't be exaggeration to say that uh, the cutting plane methods became uh, the single most important factor contributing to the success of modern uh, commercial solvers for mixed integer programs. Uh, so we'll illustrate the ideas of Gomery cuts using this simple two-dimensional example. In this example, we have the following formulation. Maximize x1 plus x2. So you have the isoprofit line uh, shown here on the plot. And the constraints would be 4x1 plus 7x2 is less than or equal to 28. Uh, and 2x1 minus 2x2 is less than or equal to 3. Both variables are non-negative and are required to be integer. So we can see that uh, this formulation is clearly not perfect. In, in an ideal formulation, this is what we want to have. So we would like to have the uh, LP relaxation to coincide with the convex hull of the feasible points uh, which are integer. All right. However, we rarely have this in practice. Perfect formulations are not easy to come up with. Uh, but this is what we are trying to achieve. So we try to improve the quality of the formulation by adding the cutting planes. All right, returning to our formulation, we can clearly see that the optimal solution for our problem is located uh, in this corner right here. And clearly it's uh, not integer. So in fact, the x2 value is integer, but x1 is non-integer. Uh, so, now what we're going to do, we will look at the basis corresponding to this uh, optimal solution. So, for this, let's recall uh, how we solve the problem using the simplex method. In the simplex method, the first step we start with is uh, converting the inequality constraints into equality constraints by introducing the slack variables. So we have the select variable S1 for the first constraint and S2 for the second constraint. And then the relation between the basic and non-basic variables would be XB is given by B inverse times B minus uh, B inverse times N times XN. So where B is the matrix consisting of the columns corresponding to the basic variables and n is the matrix consisting of the columns corresponding to the non-basic variables. To derive a Gomery cut, we will need information from the simplex tableau. So we go ahead and compute all this data using the octave. So this is a free analog of MATLAB that's accessible online. We can see that uh, b inverse times b is uh, given by 7 halves and 2, all right? And at this point, note that our matrix B is given by the first two columns here because X1 and X2 are clearly the basic variables in our optimal solution. So therefore, B is given by this matrix right here. And uh, N is given by the identity matrix that corresponds to the slack variables. So therefore, uh, B inverse times N is the same as B inverse. Since X2 is already integer in the optimal solution to the current LP relaxation, we don't need to worry about it. And instead, we need to focus our attention on uh, the X1 variable. 
So therefore, we are going to write a part of the simplex tableau that corresponds to x1. So we'll get the data from uh, this picture here. So uh, according to this uh, result, we have here x1 is equal to b inverse times b part corresponding to x1 is given by 7 halves. And then uh, the part corresponding to B inverse times N will be located in the first row of this matrix here, inverse of B. Recall that N is the identity matrix, so B inverse times N is the same as just B inverse. And also our non-basic variables at the optimal solution are given by S1 and S2. Therefore, this gives you the coefficient for S1 and this is the coefficient for S2. As a result, we have... Uh, minus uh, 1 11th S1 minus 7 over 22 S2. All right, uh, before we proceed, observe that whenever we have a feasible integer solution to this LP relaxation here, X1 and X2 must be integer. And then the coefficients for X1 and X2 are integer in both equations. And we have the integer right-hand sides as a result, whenever you have an integer feasible solution to this LP relaxation, S1 and S2 must also be integer. So, to proceed, we rearrange the terms in this equation by moving all the variables to the left. This is what you would typically have in the simplex tableau representation. So, you'll have uh, this expression right here. And now I look at uh, the coefficients for S1 and S2, because S1 and S2 are non-negative variables. If I replace these coefficients with smaller ones, the expression on the left will only become less. So therefore, we can write down the following. So X1 plus, and then round down of 1 11th is going to be 0. So we'll have a 0 coefficient for S1. Uh, round down for 7 over 22 is also 0. As a result, we only have x1 remaining on the left, and this must be now less than or equal to 7 halves. And now for any feasible integer solution, obviously we can uh, strengthen this inequality by rounding the right-hand side down. So from here, we can write down that x1 is uh, less uh, than or equal to the floor of 7 halves, which is 3. So we produce the inequality x1 is less than or equal to 3. And obviously, this inequality will hold for all the integer points contained uh, in the polyhedral set representing the feasible solution to the LP relaxation. Because the way we derived it, no integer points can be cut off. Uh, clearly, all inequalities we have here must be satisfied by all integer solutions. Okay, so therefore, we can add this inequality x1 less than or equal to 3 to our problem without violating any constraints, uh, without cutting off any feasible solutions to our integer program. So we go ahead and add this constraint x1 is less than or equal to 3. And obviously the new integer program that we obtained is equivalent to the previous one we just got a tighter formulation for the original problem because we cut off a part of the feasible region of LP relaxation that was irrelevant for our IP. So now looking at this LP relaxation, the new one, we see that the optimal solution is going to be located uh, at this point right here. And let's try to determine what uh, basic, non-basic variables we have uh, in this corner. So first of all, we can see that x1 is positive, x2 is positive. So x1 and x2 must be the basic variables. 
Uh, and then uh, the third basic variable, because now we have three inequality constraints, so we must have three basic variables. The third basic variable will be given by the slack variable for the inactive constraint at our optimal point. And this inactive constraint is uh, the second constraint here. So therefore, the basic variables will be uh, x1, x2, and s2, the slack variable corresponding to the second uh, constraint. Next, what we are going to do, we are going to build the matrix B capital, which will consist of the columns corresponding to the basic variables. So the columns will be 4, 2, 1, 7, 2, 0, and then 0, 1, 0. Then the matrix corresponding to the non-basic variables matrix N will consist of two columns corresponding to the slack variables of the first and the third uh, constraint. And we are going to compute the new basic feasible solution that is optimal right now. Again, we use uh, Octave and uh, we enter all the information into Octave and we get uh, the following solution. So inverse of B times B small is given by 3, 16 seventh and 11 seventh. And clearly we have the integer value for X1 and non-integer value for X2. And what we are going to focus on is this non-integer value. So you can see that x1 is equal to 3 in the optimal solution here. And we saw that x2 is equal to 16 seventh. So x2 and b inverse times n and given in this uh, matrix right here. So And we are focusing on uh, the second row of this matrix. So it's going to be given by... First of all, B inverse times B component uh, corresponding to X2 is uh, 16 seventh. And uh, then minus B inverse times uh, N times XN will correspond to minus 1 seventh. Then the first non-basic variable was uh, S1. And then plus 4 seventh, the second basic variable was S3. And then we're going to do the same thing we did uh, before. So we'll move everything to the left. So we'll have x2 plus 1 seventh s1. Then uh, the round down for minus 4 seventh is going to be negative 1. So we'll have x2 minus s3 is going to be less than or equal to 16 seventh. And uh, once again, observing that both x2 and s3 must be integer in any solution that would be feasible to our IP, we can actually round down the right-hand side uh, to obtain a valid inequality. So the valid inequality that we obtain is x2 minus s3 is less than or equal to 2. Okay, so now we need to express this inequality in terms of the original variables, S3 is a slack variable, so if I want to update my IP model with a tighter one that, that has a tighter LP relaxation, I need to go ahead and replace S3 with the expression for it. Uh, so S3 would be the slack variable corresponding to the third uh, constraint here that we added on the previous step, and we can see that S3 is given by 3 minus X1. So therefore, we will reformulate this by saying that S3 is equal to 3 minus X1, and this is equivalent to x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 5. So this is the new valid inequality that we produced on this step. So next we are going to add this cut to our previous uh, model. So we go ahead and add the new cut. Looking at the figure for LP relaxation we obtain after adding this new cut, we can see that now the LP relaxation has two alternative optimal solutions at extreme points and of course in infinitely many in between. Uh, but we can see that one of the optimal solutions is now integer. x1 is equal to 3 and x2 is equal to 2. And uh, if our implementation of the simplex method finds uh, this of the two corner optimal solutions, then we are done and we don't need to continue. 
But we'll assume that our simplex implementation ends up finding this uh, optimal solution. And uh, we can see that now it's fractional both for x1 and x2. So uh, then we need to add more Gomery cuts in order to cut off this uh, infeasible solution for our IP. We proceed as before by first identifying the basic variables and uh, expressing the basic variables through the non-basic. Now these, the set of basic variables is x1, x2, and then we can see that the constraints that are inactive uh, at, at this point for which uh, we have the positive flat variables, this will be the second constraint, and the third constraint will be the second and the third constraints, the flat variables will be in the basis, so s2, s1, s2, s2, and the basic variables. And then again, we go to the octave and uh, compute the expressions that we need. Both x1 and x2 are fractional, and we need to decide uh, for which variable we are going to apply the Gomery cut. Let's take x1, let's say. x1 is going to be equal to uh, 7 thirds. So x1 is taken from here, and then uh, the remaining parts will be taken from this matrix. Uh, plus... plus one-third, and the non-basic variables were S1 and S4. Again, rearranging and doing rounding, we obtain. And uh, rounding down the right-hand side, we obtain a tighter inequality X1 minus S1 plus 2 S4 is less than or equal to 2. Okay, so now we need to express S1 and S4 through X1 and X2 in order to obtain an inequality for our model. Substituting for S1 and S4 in this uh, inequality right here, we obtain X1 minus 28 minus 4 x1 minus 7 x2 plus 2 5 minus x1 minus x2 less than or equal to 2. So the coefficient for x1 is 1 plus 4 minus 2, which is 3. And the coefficient for x2 would be 7 minus 2. And this is less than or equal to negative 28 plus 10, negative 18. And then moving it to the right, we get 20. So this is the valid inequality that we eventually produce, which will add to the previous uh, IP model to obtain a tighter LP relaxation. This uh, valid inequality will cut off the previous optimal solution to the LP relaxation, but there will still be alternative optima that are non-integer. And to see this, we can just plug in the integer optimal solution into the left hand side. So x1 is equal to 3, x2 is equal to 2, and we'll obtain 19, which is less than 20. So clearly this cut doesn't pass through the optimal point and uh, it's not going to cut off all the fractional optima. Therefore, let's try to apply the Gomery cut also for x2 in addition to x1 and see if it will get the job done and will obtain a unique optimal solution, which is integer. So we proceed to octave again. In case of x2, we are looking at these parts right here. So x2 plus one third s1 minus four thirds So we obtain the following valid inequality. And it is easy to check that the corresponding line passes through the point 32, which as we already know is one of the optima for our problem and in fact uh, the only integer optimum. So next we are going to compare the last two valid inequalities that we generated. Uh, first we'll look at the cut that was obtained uh, using x1. Um, so this is the first uh, Gomery cut that we generated in the last step. And we can clearly see that it only cuts off a tiny little uh, region um, slightly above this red line. And um, we can see that there are still infinitely many optimal solutions here, only one of which is integer. So the other corner is clearly non-integer. However, when we do the second cut, which we generated using the variable x2, 
then we see that it passes through the points 0, 4 and 3, 2 and it cuts off this uh, part of the feasible region that contained all the fractional optima to the LP relaxation and as a result now we have a unique uh, solution uh, which is integer so we solve these uh, integer programs using the cutting planes. So this is how the Gomery's cutting plane method uh, generally proceeds uh, and uh, you know the way we discussed it we added one inequality at a time and we essentially resolved the corresponding LP obtained using a new cut from scratch. So because it was a two variable problem this was easy to do graphically so this was not a problem for this small example. However, what do you do in general? So once you add an extra inequality, obviously you don't want to resolve the whole LP from scratch. You want to take advantage of the previously optimal basis. And this is what we typically do in practice. Uh, because when we add a cut, what happens, uh, the previously optimal solution is not feasible anymore. And, you know, you cut off this basic optimal solution and uh, now you need some starting point to continue with the simplex iterations. Uh, but as we well know, uh, we can switch to the dual problem and uh, the previously optimal basis is still going to be feasible for the dual problem. And therefore, what we do in practice, usually we switch to the dual simplex and we find a new optimal solution hopefully with very few iterations of the uh, dual simplex. So uh, let's illustrate the idea using the last cut that we generated. So I copied the derivations uh, from the two slides before. So we started by writing down the expression for x2 as the basic variable and then what we did, we rounded down the coefficients for the non-basic variables and then we rounded down the right-hand side and we obtained this inequality right here. After that, we got rid of the slack variables in order to be able to show this uh, valid inequality clearly on the graph. When we add this cut to the previously optimal simplex tableau, then first of all, as we always do, we need to eliminate the basic variables from the rows that are not basic rows, essentially. Uh, therefore, we need to get rid of x2 if we are to add this to our simplex tableau. Okay, so how do we get rid of x2? As we always do with simplex, we go back to the row where x2 is basic and express x2 through the rest of the variables from there and substitute for x2 in our inequality. So here we have x2 is equal to 8 thirds minus 1 third s1 uh, plus 4 thirds s4 and uh, we have in this inequality x2 minus 2s4 so we're going to substitute for x2. We'll have uh, 8 thirds minus 1 third uh, s1 plus 4 thirds s4 minus 2 s4 is less than or equal to 2. As a result we obtain minus 1 third s1 minus 2 thirds s4 is less than or equal to minus 2 thirds which is the same as 1 third s1 plus 2 third s4 is greater than or equal to 2 thirds. Uh, so this is the actual cut that we would add to the currently optimal simplex tableau for the linear programming relaxation of our IP. And now when we add it to the simplex tableau we need to subtract uh, the excess variable on the left and clearly we cannot use this excess variable as the basic variable for this row because we would have a negative value for it if we did. So, uh, and this is not surprising because uh, we know that uh, this cut actually removes the previously optimal solution. So therefore, by adding this constraint, uh, we don't have a basic feasible solution anymore. 
but as we mentioned earlier we can switch to the dual problem and um, we can use the dual simplex uh, to solve uh, the result in LP. Uh, the previously optimal basis will be still feasible for the dual even after we add this cut. Alright, so let's actually pay attention to how we obtain these coefficients here for the non-basic variables in the cut that we are adding. So for the coefficient for S1, for example, it's equal to one third. And uh, one third is exactly the fractional part of the coefficient for S1 that we have right here. Then the coefficient for S4 is two thirds. And two thirds is in fact the fractional part of negative four thirds because what is negative four thirds? Negative four thirds, the integer part of this is a negative two and the fractional part is two thirds. So therefore, again, this is the fractional part of this coefficient. And similarly, two thirds is the fractional part of the right hand side here. And this is not a coincidence if we take a close look at how we derive this inequality. So essentially, we combine these two expressions here by substituting for x2 in the inequality, we obtain this inequality right here. This can also be viewed as if uh, what we did, we essentially subtracted this inequality from this equality right here. So, and then what is happening? So looking at the corresponding coefficients, x2 of course will be eliminated just like we wanted. And then uh, here you have the coefficient for s1 and the coefficient for s1 in the inequality is the integer part of the coefficient for s1 here. So therefore when you subtract an integer part of the number from the number, what you get is the fractional part of the number. And this is exactly what we get. Uh, similarly with S4 and the right hand side. And of course because we subtract uh, the inequality, the inequality sign will be reversed and we obtain greater than or equal to instead of less than or equal to. Alright, now we are ready to write down the uh, Gomery fractional cuts. So this is how we call these cuts uh, written in this form, uh, Gomery's fractional cuts. Uh, let's write it in the general form now. So let's say you solve the LP relaxation for your integer program and um, you obtain a solution that is fractional. So assume that uh, some variable xr is a basic variable that's fractional at the optimum and then uh, the expression for this basic variable uh, taken from the simplex tableau is given by xr plus the summation of uh, arj's for j in uh, the set of non-basic variables uh, multiplied by xj's equal to the right hand side uh, which is given by uh, say br bar. So let's use bar here as well because arj's would be the original coefficients uh, that we start with in the original LP and here we are talking about the row for the basic variable xr in the optimal simplex tableau for the LP relaxation. Okay, so what we did to derive the Gomery cuts, we essentially rounded down all of the arj's. So arj's, we can represent them as uh, arj is given by uh, the round down of arj or the floor plus let's denote the fractional part by frj. So where frj is essentially the fractional part of a bar rj uh, which is given by a r j bar minus the floor of a r j bar. So then we essentially replaced a r j bars with uh, their rounded down values to obtain the inequality x r 
plus the summation for j in n of a rj bar floors of this times xj is less than or equal to br bar. And uh, we also rounded down this as well to obtain the inequality we were looking for. So this is uh, our Gomery cut. So now, uh, how do we obtain the Gomery's fractional cut? We essentially substitute for this variable xr in our uh, cut that we are adding. Uh, because xr is the basic variable and, uh, you know, we need to eliminate it uh, from uh, the row that we are adding because it, uh, the basic variable can be present only in one row. And how do we do this? We do this by uh, substituting for xr by obtaining the expression for xr from this row right here, which is the basic row for xr. And uh, the other way of looking at it, as just we mentioned, uh, you could think of it as subtracting this inequality right here from uh, this, inequ this equation over here. All right, so when we subtract, what we'll obtain, xr will disappear. And when we subtract the corresponding coefficients for xj's, we'll have the summation of uh, fij's xj's will be greater or equal to, um, let's denote the fractional value of uh, br bar by uh, fb, uh, let's say. fb, where fb is uh, br bar minus the floor of uh, br bar. Okay. So this is the inequality that we obtain. And this is the Gomery's dual fractional cut or simply Gomery's fractional cut. Uh, next, we are going to consider an example of applying the Gomery cutting plane method to a problem. Uh, this example will actually involve the simplex tableaus and all the details. All right, so we are looking again at a two variable problem here. In this case, it's a minimization problem with two constraints. And we can see that uh, the optimal solution to the LP relaxation is clearly fractional. So, optimal tableau for the LP relaxation is in fact given here. So, the value of x1 at the optimal solution is 4 fifth and the value of x2 is 8 fifth. Now, we select one of the variables, let's say x2 for generating the cut. And then the way we generate the cut, we essentially look at the non-basic variables, which are x3 and x4 in our case. And we take the fractional values for the corresponding tableau coefficients and uh, we generate this inequality as follows. So you have uh, one fifth essentially is taken from here and this will be the coefficient for x3. Then two fifth, the fractional part of negative three fifth is in fact uh, two fifth. So this is where it goes. So you take the fractional uh, part of each number, right? So because uh, the integer part of negative 3 fifth is negative 1, and you, when you subtract negative 1 from negative 3 fifth, you get exactly 2 fifth. And finally, this is supposed to be greater than or equal to the fractional part of the right hand side, and you have the right hand side given by 8 fifth, the fractional part of it is given by 3 fifth. So this gives us the cut, all right? So this is very similar to what we have done uh, before. And now we are going to actually add this cut to the simplex tableau and we'll apply dual simplex method to find the new optimal solution. 
So we are adding this constraint, so we introduce the new Slack variable x5, which will be the basic variable for our newly added constraint. Uh, but of course, you have uh, the negative uh, value for this basic variable, and therefore uh, this basic solution is infeasible for the primal problem. However, looking at row 0 of the primal tableau, we see that all the coefficients are non-positive, uh, therefore, the dual simplex uh, has the feasible basis, and we switch to the dual simplex. So we apply the dual simplex iteration to this tableau, and we obtain uh, the new tableau, which is optimal. Uh, so you have here um, the solution that is also integer, so we have x1 is equal to 2, x2 is equal to 1, x3 is 3, and we obtain the optimal solution in just one cut. And uh, the next slide actually illustrates this graphically. So the cut that we generated, which is 1 fifth x3 plus 2 fifth x4 is greater or equal to 3 fifth, it can actually be expressed in terms of the original variables x1 and x2 as follows. So after we substitute for the slack variables like we did before, we would obtain the following inequality. And then if we look at it uh, graphically, then we see that with just this one cut, we obtain the optimal solution to our IP. Okay, to conclude, I would like to return to the first example we considered and uh, make a few observations that hold in general for the Gomery cutting plane method. Uh, so here at this step, we saw that when we added the cut 3x1 plus 5x2 less than or equal to 20, uh, it uh, did cut off some of the fractional optimal solutions, but not all of them. And uh, in fact, if we didn't switch to the variable x2 and didn't generate the cut corresponding to x2, perhaps we could continue generating cuts of this sort uh, that would take you a little bit closer to the optimal solution um, and would cut off some of the fractional solutions a little bit at a time. But how do we know that um, it will not last infinitely long? So this is one of the issues that you can have with uh, this cutting plane approach. So another issue, uh, just before we generated this cut, we observed that we had infinitely many optimal solutions here and one of them was integer. So if I did the right iteration of the simplex method, I could have ended up in this integer solution and there wouldn't be even a need to generate this cut right here, right? So essentially what this shows us is that uh, there are a couple of important considerations that need to be carefully considered when we design a cutting plane algorithm. So the first one is um, we saw that the simplex steps, uh, the way you do the pivots, uh, have implications on which solution you're going to get, of course, right? So therefore you need to have a strategy on uh, how do you do the simplex pivot. So that's one thing. And uh, the other thing is in cases when you have multiple fractional basic variables in your optimal solution to the LP relaxation, you need to decide which one you're gonna use to generate the Gomery's cut based on next, all right? And in fact, uh, Gomery has shown that if you apply certain lexicographic rules for the simplex pivots and for the choice of the variable that you use to generate the cut, then the method is guaranteed to converge in a finite number of steps. This Gomery's result can be used to show that we can obtain the polyhedral description of uh, the convex hull of integer points of any rational polyhedron by applying only a finite number of Gomery cuts. All right, so assume that we have a situation illustrated here. So you have a polyhedral set described by uh, these inequalities here. And uh, in general, we assume that A and B are rational. 
but uh, without loss of generality, we can assume that they are integral because we can always multiply the inequalities by the right integers to obtain this property. And uh, assume that uh, by pi we denote the convex hull of all the integer points uh, included in this polyhedral set. Okay. So then we can actually show that uh, this set pi is a polyhedral set. Therefore, it can be described by a finite number of linear inequalities. All right, so and uh, we can use the Gomery's result, uh, the result that says that uh, you can solve any integer program by applying a finite number of Gomery cuts to show a more general statement here. So this theorem states that uh, pi, the convex hull of all the integer points included in the polyhedron p, can be obtained by adding a finite number of Gomery cuts to the set of inequalities describing the polyhedral set p. Okay, so to prove this, we are gonna sketch how the proof goes. Assume that we know the inequalities defining pi and consider one of them. So let's say uh, this is one of the facets of uh, pi and assume that this inequality is given by a c transposed x is less than or equal to d. Okay, so by Gomery's result We can solve the problem of maximizing C transposed X over a PI by applying a finite number of Gomery cuts to this polyhedral set P. All right, so we start with P. So it's the same as maximizing C transposed X subject to X is in P and X integer. Okay, so and um, the optimal value for C transposed X over PI obviously is going to be equal to D. So after adding a finite number of cuts, we obtain some polyhedron that will denote by uh, P prime. And uh, our optimal objective will be obtained by optimizing over uh, this uh, set P prime. And we don't need the integrality constraints anymore because the Gomery cuts ensure that we are going to obtain uh, the integer optimal solution. Okay, so P prime here is obtained from P by adding a finite number of Gomery cuts. All right, so now we have a finite number of uh, inequalities that are required to define the polyhedral set PI. And for each of these uh, inequalities, we can apply the similar process. So now the fact that uh, this solution is obtained by optimizing over the polyhedral set P prime implies that for every X in P prime, we have the inequality C transposed X less than or equal to D satisfied. So this inequality is valid for our polyhedral set P prime. All right, so now there is only a finite number of defining hyperplanes that are required to describe uh, the set PI, and we can apply this process for every defining hyperplane. And um, this way, we can actually show that the resulting polyhedron, so after applying, let's say, k rounds uh, of this process, we'll obtain the polyhedral set uh, PK. And this polyhedral set is going to be within PI. 
because all the defining hyperplanes for pi are going to be valid for this uh, set pk. Okay, so but on the other hand, when we apply Gomery's cuts, we always ensure that uh, the convex hull of the integer points within the polyhedron is inside uh, the polyhedral set that we obtain. So we never cut off the integer points. Therefore, uh, pi is going to be a subset of uh, pk. So therefore, we have the inclusion both ways and pk is going to be equal to pi and uh, the statement is proved. So we can use the Gomery cuts and the Gomery cutting plane method to solve any integer program. We can start with an arbitrary formulation and no matter how bad it is, uh, the theory tells us that we can solve it by applying only a finite number of Gomery cuts. Now, not only that, we can actually obtain uh, the perfect description of the polyhedral set representing the convex hull of the integer point of any rational polyhedron. This is a nice property to have and the main advantage of this approach is of course its uh, generality. Uh, on the other hand, the drawback is that it doesn't really take advantage of the specific uh, structural properties of the problem that it is solving. So, but these general purpose methods, they're quite important and um, they are an integral part of uh, general purpose solvers uh, used for integer programming and mixed integer programming. And the next major step in the direction of development general purpose cuts was uh, associated with the name of uh, Vashek Kvatal, who published his uh, first paper on the topic in 1973. And um, apparently he was not familiar with uh, Gomery's cutting plane method and his motivation for uh, developing this direction was looking at uh, combinatorial optimization problems. In particular, he was interested in uh, matching polytope. Here I put a quote uh, that is not by Vashek Kvatal, but uh, the first time I saw it was in his book on linear programming. Uh, this philosophy of learning on examples is uh, what makes this book one of the greatest uh, sources on the topic, in my opinion, and we'll try to follow this approach. So we'll start by looking at some examples. Okay, we'll illustrate the idea of the huatal gomery inequalities using the same example as we used for the Gomery cuts. And uh, the idea is very straightforward and natural and in fact it was implicitly used in the Gomery cuts as we'll discuss later. So let's look at uh, these rows right here. Similarly to how we can generate uh, the dual problem, we can look at multiplying each row by some non-negative scalars. So for example we multiply this by u1 which is greater or equal to zero, and the second row is multiplied by u2, which is non-negative. And uh, obviously, because we multiply by non-negative scalars, the inequalities resulting after the multiplication still remain valid for our LP. And then uh, we can sum up these two inequalities after multiplying to obtain another valid inequality. So which will be 4 times u1 plus 2 times u2 uh, x1 plus 7 u1 minus 2 u2 x2. And this must be less than or equal to 28 u1 plus 3 u2. Okay. So now, what we do next is exactly the same thing we have done in the Gomery cut. By observing that x1 and x2 are non-negative and uh, if you round down to the closest integer that's uh, below the coefficient for x1 and x2, the resulting expression will be at most as large as what we had before and therefore the following inequality will be valid. So you'll have 4u1 plus 2u2, 
rounded down multiplied by x1 plus uh, the round down of 7u1 minus 2u2 times x2 and this is less than or equal to 28u1 uh, plus 3u2 and then because x1 and x2 are integers the following inequality will also be valid so we'll have a 4u1 plus 2u2 x1 plus 7u1 minus 2u2 rounded down x2 is less than or equal to the right hand side is also rounded down now. So essentially uh, uh, the idea very similar to what we have in the Gomery cut and in fact uh, I said that um, it's already used in the Gomery cuts right so other than this rounding down part the multiplication by the scalars is also implicitly used in Gomery cuts uh, because what we do with Gomery cuts we essentially take a row from the simplex tableau but how do we obtain the rows in the simplex tableau so we obtain them by doing the elementary row operations and the elementary row operations is exactly multiplying some rows by constants and adding to other rows so here for all choices of u1 and u2 we are going to obtain a valid inequality and of course the choice of these multipliers is extremely important uh, in terms of uh, the quality of the valid inequality that we are gonna get so let's look at some specific examples for this particular case so when we set u1 to 111 so essentially we multiply this by 111 here and multiply this by 7 over 22 then uh, what we'll get after summing up will be this valid inequality right here which is exactly the same valid inequality we obtained uh, using the Gomery's method all right so similarly once we add this inequality to the set of uh, constraints we can generate uh, the next uh, Gomery cut that we already did uh, in this example when we discussed the Gomery cut in planes we can obtain that cut by using u1 equal to 1 7th u2 equal to 0 and u3 equal to 3 7th so by multiplying the respective rows by uh, these uh, multipliers we get um, the valid inequality that we obtained uh, previously so it's uh, x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 5. So next we give the formal description of how we generate the quantile Gomery inequalities uh, we are given this polyhedron uh, defined by the inequalities ax is less than or equal to b x is greater than or equal to 0 and uh, a1 through an are the columns of the matrix a and uh, they can be any rational or even real numbers and let's denote by pi the convex hull of all the integer points that belong to this polyhedral set p then the first step is to actually choose the vector of non-negative multipliers u so we pick m multipliers put them in the vector u and we multiply in the system ax is less than or equal to b by u transposed from the left on both sides uh, obviously what results will be a valid inequality for p so next what we do we round down the coefficients for xj's because uh, xj's are all non-negative so decreasing the coefficients for these variables it will definitely not make the left hand side larger so therefore uh, the resulting inequality will still be valid for our set p all right so finally because xj's are all integers we can round down the right hand side as well and now this is going to be a valid inequality for pi not for p anymore but for pi 
and um, our goal is in fact to cut out as much of p as possible so that we don't cut out any of the integer points just how we tried to do it with the Gomery cuts all right so now, uh, in the previous example that we considered, we saw that uh, the way we generated uh, the quartal Gomery cuts, we specifically selected the coefficients uh, by which we multiply the inequalities so that we produce the inequalities that were generated using the Gomery cuts. Okay, so this was not a coincidence. We picked these coefficients specifically and next we explain exactly the process of how these are selected and we'll state it as a theorem. Okay, so we start with this polyhedral set as before. We still have the same notation for the matrix A and the columns within the matrix A. So, but now we require that uh, all the entries in the matrix and in the right hand side are integer. Okay, okay, so this is without loss of generality, really, because uh, we can generalize this to rational polyhedra, so any rational coefficients can be multiplied by respective integers so that uh, the system becomes integer. Okay, so now by SI, we denote the ith slack variable, so which is the slack variable for the ith inequality constraint in our system. Then when we perform the simplex steps, we essentially split all the variables into basic and non-basic. And what we have in the simplex tableau at every step is essentially this uh, system here. B inverse multiplied by A, which consists of basic and non-basic columns arranged properly, multiplied by the vector of variables, which also are arranged uh, in a way that uh, the basic variables here go first and then non-basic variables according to this representation uh, but also the variables consist of two different types uh, there are the original variables and uh, there are the slack variables and uh, remember when we first considered the uh, Gomery cut uh, example we actually tried to express the cuts in terms of the original variables so now what we want to do is to express the Gomery cut in terms of the original variables and we'll show that uh, this will correspond to a specific quartal Gomery inequality thus showing that uh, the Gomery cut is um, a very specific case of the quartal Gomery inequality. Okay, so we have uh, this simplex representation and then what do we do with uh, the Gomery cut? Uh, if we denote by beta k the k row of the matrix uh, B inverse, then essentially what we have in this system, it can be expressed uh, using this uh, equation right here. Okay, and um, all the coefficients for the corresponding variables. So first we sum up the uh, coefficients multiplied by xj variables and then we have the terms corresponding to the slack variables we kind of separate them and then what we're gonna do we are gonna get rid of the slack variables so that the expression is written completely in terms of the original variables all right so but uh, this is how the expression looks like so essentially you multiply this k row of the inverse uh, of b by the um, B n by this matrix right here, okay, so and then you, you multiply uh, B k by B in order to obtain the right hand side, so and this is going to give us the kth equation in our simplex tableau. And then what we do in that kth equation, we round down the coefficients for all the variables, and then we round down the right hand side to obtain the Gomery cut. Okay, so of course, uh, these coefficients, uh, some of them will be integer. In particular, the variable that's basic for this row is going to have the coefficient of 1. Then um, there will be a bunch of zeros, like for other basic variables, you have the coefficients equal to 0, so they will be already integer. So, but the round down in this case will just give you a 0. So, but this expression essentially gives you the general representation for the Gomery cut uh, written in terms of the original and slack variables. 
So then how do we proceed with the fractional Gomery cut? We essentially eliminate this basic variable from the system and uh, we uh, obtain the new tableau and we proceed with the dual simplex method, right? So, but um, in our case here, we want to uh, express everything in terms of x's and eliminate uh, s's so that we can kind of add uh, this inequality to our system so it will be more similar to what we do in the quartal Gomery procedure, okay? So, uh, now we replace the slack variables with their expressions in terms of the original variables and the expression is given by what we have in the system, right? So for i row, we will have the i slack variable is given by b i, the right hand side in the i inequality minus the left hand side in the i inequality. And then um, after we substitute for s i, we are going to obtain this equivalent expression now expressing everything in terms of x j's with no slack variables present anymore. Uh, next, recall that uh, aj is an integral vector and so is uh, the vector b. Therefore, we can simplify the expressions uh, here as well as on the right-hand side. Okay, so because uh, the aj vector is integral, we can write that a beta k multiplied by aj is the same as the round down of the whole thing. So because aj is integral again, and uh, therefore looking at this difference right here, both terms under the floor sign are integers here. Therefore, we can actually replace this difference with the following. So it's gonna be equal to uh, the floor of uh, beta k minus the floor of beta k multiplied by aj. Okay, and then we are going to denote this uh, difference here by gamma k and we can see that the same difference will be obtained in the right hand side as well. So as a result, what we are going to obtain next is uh, the following. So again, we replace uh, this difference with gamma k and the Gomery cut can be expressed as uh, here in this formula. Okay, so we expressed it through the original variables only and we can see now that uh, what we have as the coefficients for xj's would be the fractional part, so essentially gamma k is the fractional part of the entries in the kth row of uh, B inverse matrix. Next we state this result as a formal theorem so we are considering this polyhedral set. Uh, we assume that all the entries of the matrix A and vector B are integers. And we denote by beta K, the Kth row of B inverse matrix in an optimal basis of the problem of maximizing some linear function over the polyhedral set P. And let uh, gamma K denote the fractional part of uh, the row beta K. So then the Gomery cut for rho k can be expressed in terms of the original variables as follows. Uh, now uh, this essentially shows that uh, the Gomery cut is nothing else but the Huatl Gomery inequality where the multipliers are given by the entries of this vector gamma k. All right and uh, I recommend you going back to the examples that we considered and verifying that this is indeed the case for all the cuts uh, that we generated in the Gomery cut example. Uh, finally, I would like to mention the concept of the quartal rank of a polyhedron. Uh, so assume that we are given a rational polyhedron P in Rn and uh, let's denote as before by Pi the convex hull of all the integer points that belong to P. So first we define the quartal closure to be this set PCH which uh, consists of all the points in P that satisfy all the quartal Gomery inequalities. So essentially think about trying to generate all the possible quartal Gomery inequalities by using all possible multipliers. 
So it's gonna give us some polyhedral set. Okay, so and that polyhedral set doesn't actually have to coincide with the convex hull of the set of integer points uh, because uh, in the procedure for which we proved that it has to lead uh, to the convex hull, we actually used the newly generated inequalities as a part of the mix. All right, so but uh, what we can do, we can look at the quartal closure and we can apply the quartal Gomery procedure to the closure by treating it as, as P and instead of P. Uh, so therefore, we can uh, denote by P1 the quartal closure of P. And then uh, once we obtain the quartal closure, we can apply the quartal Gomery cuts to this uh, new polyhedral set to obtain the P2 and so on, we can keep uh, going like this by generating pk to be uh, the quartal closure of pk minus 1 uh, for k greater than or equal to 2. Now, since the quartal Gomery inequalities contain all the Gomery cuts among them, we know that uh, there is a finite k after which pk is going to be equal to pi, which is exactly what we are trying to achieve here. All right, uh, therefore, uh, a, an important question from the complexity perspective is uh, how many rounds of these uh, valid inequalities I'll have to generate. So in other words, what is the smallest k such that pk equals to pi? And this smallest k is exactly the quartal rank uh, that we wanted to define. Intuitively, the higher is the quartal rank, uh, the more complicated the problem is, the harder it is to solve, all right? And uh, the, since uh, quartal Gomery inequalities uh, can technically represent any valid inequality for our polyhedron, uh, there are many different procedures of how we generate the valid inequalities, and uh, it is interesting to see what is their representation in terms of the quartal Gomery inequalities. Okay, so this is uh, all uh, for this lecture. So uh, hopefully this brief summary of uh, the Gomery cuts and uh, quartal Gomery inequalities, uh, some main results on these topics was informative. I think you have given a beautiful summary, in fact. We do know that the statement is true. All right, more cuts are coming, including some deeper theory. So stay tuned and don't forget to do the homework.